Okay. Um, now, I think there might be something, a, a little bar across the top, but hopefully it, it seems to be popping up every time someone enters the room. But um, hopefully it's not obscuring too much of the text on my slides. But um, do in, interrupt me and let me know if you, if you can't see enough of, of what I'm talking about. So I'll be um, looking back today at um, various pieces of research that I've been involved in over the last um, five or six years of my uh, postdoctoral career. Um, and the, the title, as you see here, is Social Linguistic Ethno Ethnography in the COVID-19 Era, uh, Exploring Language and Identity in Scotland, um, New Scotland, um, by which I mean Nova Scotia, the province of Nova Scotia in Canada, uh, and New England um, to contrast with, with New Scotland. But I'll, I'll get to that in, in due course and draw a bit of attention to these uh, particular um, place names and, and terminology. So... Just to give you a brief um, overview of the, the, the talk I'll be uh, giving this, this uh, afternoon, or I suppose this morning or this, this evening, depending on uh, whereabouts in the world you're based. Um, first, to talk briefly uh, about um, the sort of key results, key uh, uh, findings in my uh, 2019 monograph, a book which was published about 18 months ago now, which looks particularly at uh, immersion education outcomes in the Scottish context, the degree to which um, new speakers of Gaelic were or, or weren't being produced through the, the education system, before moving on to talk to, uh, uh, to you all about my um, postdoctoral fellowship, uh, which ran from 2016 to 2019, um, and which investigated the role of, of these, these new speakers in Gaelic revitalization in two divergent contexts. So that's uh, Scotland in um, the UK and the Northwest of Europe and uh, the province of Nova Scotia in Maritime Canada, and which examined the relationship of new speakers, uh, Gaelic language use, their linguistic practices, their language ideologies and cultural identities as well. Um, and all of this work is supposed to be coming together into a, a monograph which is due um, in a couple of months with, with Edinburgh University Press. It might be a wee bit delayed due to the impact of um, the pandemic, which has is, is just um, obviously caused untold suffering and misery all over the world, but has also caused a, a great deal of, of, of professional inconvenience um, and uh, the impact that um, childcare with a, a three-year-old and a one-year-old running around at home um, has, has impacted upon my ability to deliver this, this work on time and on schedule, but we'll get to that in due course. So firstly, I just wanted to talk to you about this picture, this blackboard, um, which I, I, I photographed on Halifax Boardwalk, Halifax being the, the main city in, in Nova Scotia, uh, and to sort of direct people into this uh, clothing shop called New Scotland, New Scotland Clothing Company. Um, so it's come inside rope. Nova Scotia is Latin for New Scotland, which is very useful um, for, for everyone, uh, for those of you whose, whose Latin is as rusty as mine uh, in any case. So Nova Scotia is Latin for uh, New Scotland. And so impressed was I by uh, this particular uh, metalinguistic comment on the, the blackboard in Nova Scotia, in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, that I went and bought um, a New Scotland hoodie, and you can see that's a, a sort of close-up of, of me wearing that uh, hoodie there. So the analysis that I conducted between 2017, 2016 and 19 as part of this work was based firstly on an online survey of language practices, um, language learning and attitudes, which um, received uh, 80 uh, uh, responses uh, over the course of the fellowship. I also conducted interviews with 30 speakers in Scotland, 30 of these new speakers of Gaelic and 30 in Nova Scotia as well. Also, as part of the research, uh, conducted community ethnography, um, con participating in focus groups, uh, participation in language classes, community meetings, and just day-to-day -day life um, in, in Nova Scotia for the, the period in which I was actually based there. Um, 12 weeks being of research in, in Nova Scotia um, compared to uh, 12 years of, of research, you know, ongoing research, I should say, in Scotland. Um, currently, this kind of research just wouldn't have been possible. So I was very fortunate in lots of ways that um, the, my, my postdoc 
um, wound up in sort of November 2019. So pretty much round about just the same time that the first cases of um, COVID SARS were, were probably being recorded in Wuhan province. So um, fortunate in that respect that I was able to conduct the research at the time. Um, perhaps not so fortunate that I, I was awarded last year um, a scholarship by the Royal Society of Edinburgh to conduct a Fulbright um, at Harvard University. And I was, that was going to be last autumn from October to December. And then it was always three, uh, it was delayed until May this year. And then obviously it's been kicked into the long grass again, but hopefully um, by the end of this, this year, I'll, I'll, I'll be, be there based in Boston for um, 12 weeks or so to examine uh, connections to, to Nova Scotia Gaelic and uh, the Gaelic community in New England generally, but I'll get to that in, in due course. So to look in a bit more depth now at um, my the, the monograph which I published about 18 months ago now, the key findings of which really um, as, you, as you'll see. So the research was based on 46 interviews with uh, adults who'd started in um, Gaelic immersion education or so-called Gaelic, Gaelic medium education in the first decade of its availability, yeah, employing an ethnography of speaking methodology. And hopefully that'll make sense a, a wee bit later when I'm actually talking about the data. And um, also used a, an online survey again, um, which received 130 responses. Um, so using the, the both the, the two uh, different methodologies which informed the book, um, the, the sample approximated about 10% of all adults who'd started in Gaelic medium education in the first decade of its availability. And the, the, the sort of key headline findings really were widely varying competencies um, and levels of Gaelic oracy. So that's levels of fluency and speaking ability in the language. There are consistent statistical correlations between um, higher levels of language ability and language use, um, something you might really expect there. Also higher levels uh, of uh, usage and socialization in Gaelic in the home community domain during childhood and between um, higher levels of present day Gaelic use and continuity in Gaelic immersion beyond the primary level. So these are pretty important correlations. Um, generally, and this came through particularly in the qualitative as well as the quantitative analysis, um, the finding that Gaelic was only being used really to a limited extent by the majority of past students. Um, and one of the underlying factors behind this appeared to be that the idea of having any sort of separate or distinctive Gaelic identity or identity as a Gael um, was downp downplayed uh, or, or rejected outright by a majority due to what participants described as stigmatization uh, surrounding that particular terminology. So to talk in a bit more detail, focus in on, on Gaelic in Scotland uh, and really sort of accelerating decline of the language since the 19th century, you can see in this series of maps, uh, the sort of the coloured areas towards the north and west of Scotland are the area which we, we call now the Highlands and Islands or in the Gaelic language, Agaeltach, so the Gaelic speaking area. And the linguistic boundary between um, Gaelic and English speaking populations in Scotland was reasonably stable from the, the high Middle Ages, from the 14th century or so. So the area that you see in the top left um, of the screen that's coloured, this would be the, the more mountainous highlands. Um, and the, the boundary between the colourful area and the, the sort of the grey, boring area, the, the lowlands, was fairly stable um, for three or four hundred years. Um, the highland line is the, the term that's referred to the boundary between the, the, the colourful highlands and islands and the lowlands here. And in the 16th, 17th centuries, about 50% of the Scottish population were, were living in the Highland areas, um, the colourful areas here on the maps. But it became an explicit policy of the Scots state to um, undermine Gaelic culture uh, and it, sort of um, linguistic and cultural independence from the 16th century. Um, and particularly during the 18th century, the socioeconomic uh, so-called improvements, and in the 19th century, the so-called uh, clearances by which this is, these are sort of systemic processes of um, land reorganization that led to the landowners um, requiring people who'd lived on their land uh, for, and, and their ancestors for, for centuries and centuries were removed from, the, from those communities, were displaced 
um, encouraged to go and find work in industry on the coast or in the cities in Scotland, or to emigrate to different countries altogether, and very large numbers ending up in um, the Carolinas, in the, the, what became the United States, um, in Australia and New Zealand, and also particularly in um, maritime Canada. And I'll get to talk a bit more about the significance of that point in a few moments. So in terms of um, Gaelic in, in Scotland in the present day, well, this is a, a map again, you see the darker, the more shaded areas in this map showing uh, greater concentrations of Gaelic speakers in, in Scotland in the 2011 census. So 10-year-old um, data really, and the, the census which was planned to be conducted this year in Scotland has now been delayed until next year due to the COVID pandemic. So we'll, we'll not get a much clearer picture of what's going on um, in terms of reported Gaelic ability and Gaelic use um, until uh, presumably 2023 20, at the earliest. Uh, but in any case, the 2011 census showed that um, just under 58,000 reported, self-reported speakers of Gaelic in Scotland, um, or just over 1% of the total population of Scotland, with the highest concentrations being in the Western Isles, you see at the the top left of the screen here, where over 50% of the population could still speak the language. But the map doesn't show here um, that there are now sort of equal proportions of Gaelic speakers living in the more densely coloured areas, uh, the darker areas in the Highlands Islands and the, the lighter coloured lowlands. So in terms of actual numbers, we don't really get that um, same picture in this map. And <clears throat> Just to talk briefly, I only want to do a sort of very high level um, critical discourse analysis of, of these texts, but just to demonstrate the importance uh, attached to, to Gaelic immersion education, to GME, as a means of uh, revitalizing Gaelic in Scotland and of creating new speakers. So the first extract we have here is from um, the draft National Gaelic Language Plan, which is this is the third iter iteration of the plan, which was produced by Borsna Gaelic, the national policymaker for, for Gaelic in, in relation to its um, revitalization in Scotland. And um, the reason I wanted to draw attention to this in particular, it's only a draft, but um, social linguistically, it's, it's quite nuanced, it's quite sensible. So they said, ensuring that the growing population of young Gaelic speakers, so that's um, those, those individuals coming through Gaelic medium education is supported to continue to use the language and to pass on to the next generation is critical to the maintenance of Gaelic as a living language. So it sort of um, displays awareness of the need to create opportunities for um, former students to uh, carry on speaking the language to potentially pass on to their own children in the future. So um, not far wrong, social linguistically speaking, um, so quite nuanced uh, shows an awareness. That line was gone from the, the national plan as it was published in 2018. And in its place was this um, couple of sentences, Gaelic education is central to the ambition of Gaelic growth. And for this reason, education and learning will remain central to this plan as they were to the previous plan. And indeed the, the, the plan before that. Our clear view is that Gaelic education makes an important contribution theme of increasing the numbers of those speaking, using, and learning the language. So less nuanced, more focus on the education system per se, rather than supporting um, individuals who come through the education system to carry on speaking the language. Um, and the Scottish National Party, there's a, an election uh, going on here in Scotland at the moment. The Scottish National Party formed the, the government, they formed the, the government in Scotland for the last decade or so now, for, uh, um, but uh, and it looks likely they will form the next government as well, but it's it's a bit unsure um, currently as to uh, what exactly the makeup of that government will be. But they said in their manifesto a couple of weeks ago, we remain committed to ensuring Gaelic as a sustainable long term future. In particular, we have we will have a focus on arresting the intensifying language shift in the main vernacular communities, which is very encouraging to see. Gaelic medium education is a key driver for ensuring that Gaelic continues to thrive and grow in both urban and rural areas. So again, just looking really at these extracts to, to demonstrate the importance, the significance attached to immersion education as a strategy to revitalize the language here. Now, as Anik was um, mentioning at the start of um, this presentation, he and I and various other um, esteemed colleagues were part of this 
um, European Cooperation Science and Technology uh, Actions, Cost Action, uh, IS 1306, um, on new speakers between 2014 and 2017. And a lot of very important work was produced through this um, network uh, in this period. So um, the development of the new speaker concept is particularly associated with Professor Bernadette O'Rourke and her colleagues, um, uh, many of whom contribute to the, contributed to this uh, cost action. Um, and new speakers are defined as individuals who've acquired an additional language outside of the home often as part of formal education and who make frequent use of it in the course of their daily life. So not just people who are learners, not just people who previously learned the language, but now have no connection to the language, but those who actually do continue to use it, who might pass it on to their own children, for example. And research themes um, in this uh, sub-discipline have tended to focus on authenticity, cultural identities, linguistic trajectories, or uh, mudas in uh, the Catalan word uh, muda, to refer to a particular point in the life cycle um, where individuals make a choice to consciously change their own linguistic practices and notions of legitimacy, um, as well as ideas surrounding fluidity, multiplicity and negotiation in the display of cultural identities, um, somewhat contrasting with um, Fishmanian conceptions of the, the, the necessary, uh, the, the, the importance of this, this um, theoretical uh, construct of uh, exians via exish, so um, cultural identity which is conveyed through a minority language alone um, without the, the same degree of fluidity that we might see in post-modernity. Um, and the significance again, uh, just to, to, to come back to this theme um, of the new speaker phenomenon in Scotland and Canada is the frequent reference that policymakers in both polities uh, make to uh, schools and second language acquisition generally for the, the future development of Gaelic in, in uh, those countries. In terms of previous uh, research on new speakers of Gaelic in Scotland, I was part of uh, some a research team that looked into this in 2014. Um, the term Gaelic community or Coyersnach uh, na Gaelic was seen as preferable um, among new speakers to using the ethnonym Gaels or Gael. Um, so generally new speakers weren't, didn't consider themselves to be Gales. And the significance of that, um, I'll, I'll draw out a little bit further in due course. Um, and different linguistic behaviors were reported and observed among new speakers in our research. Native speakers were seen as the best model for their production, for uh, their blas, uh, their, which is uh, the Gallic word for, for accent or taste. Um, but native speakers, greater use of English loan words in their conversations were, was something which was seen as problematic by some new speakers, um, but generally it was found that native speakers weren't really perceived to be um, a homogeneous group to any greater extent than new speakers were. Um, and research that's been led by Claire Nance and colleagues has looked closely at new Gaelic speakers' linguistic productions, particularly in relation to word final rhotics, which were found to be widely variable and in some cases very divergent from those of native speakers. And um, in, as part of this, this sort of third wave variationist perspective that uh, Claire brought to bear on these data, uh, we looked at some of the ideas uh, behind uh, new speakers' uh, sort of targets for their linguistic productions. Uh, for instance, we had this one speaker, we gave the pseudonym Polly. She was asking, why would I have a North East accent? For example, I've never been there. Right, we'll move on to talk about uh, Nova Scotia, New Scotland specifically now. So um, this is broadly uh, where it's located in the Maritime Provinces, the three provinces of New Brunswick, uh, PEI, Prince Edward Islands and Nova Scotia. So um, Halifax, the, the, the capital of, of Nova Scotia, being sort of five, six hundred miles to the northeast of New York, slightly less, slightly closer to Boston, slightly further to um, Toronto, Chicago, and so on. And um, the particular areas of, of Gaelic settlement in this, what was essentially one of Scotland's oldest colonies going back to the 1620s, um, but Highland Gaelic settlement was, was concentrated really between 1773 and the, the 1840s. And the principal areas of Gaelic settlement in Nova Scotia were really towards the, the east of the province. So um, in Pictou and Antigonish counties on the mainland, and also throughout Cape Breton Island that you see here 
um, to put it to the far east of the province, Scotland being sort of two uh, and a half thousand miles that way across the Atlantic Ocean. And at that time, the, the, the voyage across the, the ocean was, was not pleasant. It was quite a dangerous and, um, and, and not particularly enjoyable experience. Uh, but um, as a result of these highland clearances, these, uh, as I say, these systematic processes by which landowners forced or coerced their um, tenants to relocate, to, to move off the land so that they could, in, in their place, they could uh, rear sheep on this quite mountainous terrain. Um, the, the motivation there being really that uh, sheep could be, uh, could turned grass, uh, turned pasture into meat, uh, which could be sold at market. You couldn't do that with um, people subsisting on the land. So uh, the people were moved off the land. They were moved, were required to um, seek a living elsewhere, whether on the coasts in, in the highlands, in the cities, in the lowlands or in England or um, uh, in other parts of the British Empire um, entirely. And as I say, the, the sort of peak period for emigration was between the 1770s and the 1840s. And really this, this migration was um, characterized by what we term chain migration. So essentially uh, we saw communities which had been um, cleared in the highlands and islands being essentially transplanted into um, uh, new communities in, in Nova Scotia. We had al almost the transplantation of these old communities into um, uh, new, new, new uh, communities within the, the very heavily forested uh, parts of particularly Cape Breton Islands and also parts of uh, uh, mainland eastern Nova Scotia. And the, the precise numbers of those who made this dangerous voyage are somewhat unclear. unclear. It seems that at least 25,000 did make the voyage and by the end of the 19th century there were around 80,000 Gaelic speakers in the province. And Gaelic speaking communities in eastern districts of Nova Scotia really flourished initially. Um, their language was passed on through the generations, their uh, culture was maintained, uh, the ethno-linguistic identity associated with, with Gaelic remained very very strong. Uh, but after about 1880 we started to see um, a sort of slight decline in the in use of the language um, without any institutional support for Gaelic, um, increasing contact with um, an English dominant society as in Scotland and increased economic vulnerability. So as a consequence, um, onwards out migration continued from particularly from Cape Breton um, and the east of Nova Scotia, whether to, to Halifax um, or further afield to um, New England, to the, the Boston states as they're referred to um, locally, to Ontario or even to the Canadian prairies um, out west. Throughout the 20th century, the, the Gaelic language continued to, to decline and really accelerated from the, the 1930s. So um, the anthropologist Elizabeth Merch did some extremely useful sort of fine-grained analysis of the reasons behind um, the, the linguistic tip uh, from English to Gaelic in Nova Scotia. And she identified the 1930s as really the key juncture, the key um, period for uh, reaching this linguistic tip. And, um, uh, and then hastening, accelerating the decline of Gaelic in the province. And as you all know, the 1930s was at the time of the, the, the Great Depression and the economic impacts that um, this time period had on Gaelic speakers' language ideologies in the province and um, via what she termed the community's metapragmatic filter. So the sort of um, ideological lens through which the community assigned various um, values to uh, the languages that, they, that were available to them. And throughout so each subsequent decade of the 20th century, we saw numbers of Gaelic speakers recorded in uh, decennial uh, censuses declining uh, by about 50% until um, in 2001, there were just 542 speakers recorded in Nova Scotia. In 2011, this was up to, uh, as you see, uh, 1,275. So uh, it might be the case that we're starting to see the language return to some sort of growth, um, but it remains fairly unclear. And that, that comes with all the caveats that usually apply to census data of this kind and limitations as to what they, what they can actually tell us. 
In terms of contemporary um, language policy, revitalization of, of uh, Gaelic in Nova Scotia, really we can trace this back to the establishment of um, bottom-up efforts at the start of this century, which were supplemented um, uh, later in that decade uh, by the establishment of institutional supports. So in 2004, Finding McClough um, was invited over from Scotland to introduce his Total Immersion Plus model, which really uh, was, was uh, very influential in, in Nova Scotia and formed the basis of the Gaelic Ekbale, um, Gaelic in the Home programmes, which have been um, really taken off in Nova Scotia, emphasising the importance of contact between native and fluent speakers uh, and learners in the home domain and making it part of, a, if you like, the, the home community in a day-to-day -day sense. In 2009, um, the Bonus Bauer uh, programme began. This is a, a master apprentice model, which was very heavily influenced by Leanne Hinton's work. And indeed, Le Leanne and Professor Hinton uh, visited uh, Nova Scotia in 2011 to talk a wee bit more about this model. Um, and currently, it seems there are, there are well over 4,000 people in Nova Scotia are involved in some form of instruction with Gaelic elements, um, whether that's it's sort of Gaelic cultural studies generally or um, explicit language uh, instruction. And um, May of every year, so not many, too many days now until um, this starts uh, for, for 2021, May is designated as Nova Scotia Gaelic Month. Um, and this is a poster which was um, put together a few years ago now to, uh, to publicize um, Nova Scotia Gaelic Month. So uh, we have at the top here, Na Gael Frivichtje um, meaning the Gales rooted here. So the emphasis really here on uh, the Gales as, as a people um, and as a distinctive ethno-linguistic group. And it depicts six generations of the Cameron family going right back to um, Ellen Makianushchen uh, back in 1821, who's described as a pioneer settler, but one of the, the, the first um, migrants to, to Nova Scotia from the, the Highlands, and going through the six generations all the way down to uh, Wimali and Alistair, um, at the bottom there, and it, so it depicts 140 years of, of Gaelic transmission, intergenerational transmission of the language within the home, within the community, um, and the emphasis really being on, on native speakers and the, the nativity, or if you like, of um, Gales to Nova Scotia. And we have at the bottom here, uh, Gaelic runs deep here. Um, and it's interesting to note as well that the, the Gaelic given in italics underneath Mias Nangail doesn't mean um, Nova Scotia Gaelic month as such, but literally means um, the month of the Gales. So that's interesting and important to note. Um, in terms of official support for Gaelic in Nova Scotia in 20, 2006, 2006, uh, Rodney MacDonald, who was then the premier, sort of prime minister of, of Nova Scotia, established um, the Office of Gaelic Affairs, Office Emerson the Gaelic, uh, with a relatively modest budget. Um, uh, now just employing three permanent members of staff, but there are there, there were six due to budget cuts over the years. And currently the, the minister with responsibility with the portfolio for, for Gaelic affairs is uh, Suzanne Lonescroft pictured here. And in their own words, the office exists to support Nova Scotians in the reclamation of Gaelic heritage, cultural identity, assisting in the building of communities through social and ec economic contributions. And they say they, they seek to support adults and youth to further their language and cultural skills, develop their, their, their identity as Gales. Now, this, this sense is not something we ever see in policy documents or uh, descriptions in, in Scotland. So that's, that's a real crucial difference um, to help to reinforce a sense of belonging, connection to community, and also crucially to provide a sense of hope in staying, living and working in the province of Nova Scotia. So that's to say, uh, seeking to counteract this ongoing out migration to places such as Boston um, uh, or Toronto. I'll come back specifically to Boston, the New England context towards the end of the, the talk. Um, this was a, another uh, poster designed to advertise, or at least it's a zoomed in section of a poster designed to publicize uh, Mias Nangale. Um, and we see in the middle here, estai e de chile, um, at home with one another, getting in with each other. Um, Nova Scotians are connecting with their Gaelic language, culture and identity, and that's happening to an increasing extent. Uh, the sort of small bit, hopefully you can see it in the middle, says, Gales are a distinct ethnocultural community who persisted in, in Nova Scotia for generations. So again, a very different emphasis to, 
from anything we see in Scotland generally. Uh, and a bit more on what uh, the, the office, uh, what uh, the, the Office of Organic Affairs is uh, describing their own sort of, the, their mission statement really. Um, they say they help Nova Scotians reclaim their Gaelic heritage and identity as a basis for cultural, spiritual, community and economic renewal. So aims really going far beyond just language revitalization, but more holistic uh, approach being adopted. Um, and these aims can be achieved by creating greater awareness of Gaelic um, and its contribution to Nova Scotia's diversity, community life and economy, and providing language training, support materials, innovative programming, strategic advice, research translation. So really the emphasis here being on second language acquisition for, for, for creating greater numbers of Gales, of Gaelic speakers in Nova Scotia through um, language acquisition activities. Now, the, the 2016 census showed a slight decline in the numbers of reported Gaelic speakers in Nova Scotia, and only 145 reported that it was their um, mother tongue. So there's various different ways that we can interpret that, but it, it, it is the case that the remaining number of uh, the re remaining community of, of native speakers in Nova Scotia is, um, is at the point of vanishing. There's, there's very few left. But at the same time, there are fluent new speakers um, who are raising their own children to be native speakers. So um, it's almost as if the, 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 the sense of apostolic succession, there isn't, there isn't really a gap between um, the native speakers and the new speakers. And, and in, in the creation, the generation of new speakers in Nova Scotia has really involved very heavily the remaining native speakers. Um, just 60 people, though, reported that Gaelic was a language which was spoken most often at home. And you know, obviously this doesn't allow any room for um, more complex uh, linguistic practices, you know, bilingualism between English and Gaelic, or indeed trilingualism uh, with uh, uh, English and French and Gaelic, or uh, even the indigenous Mi'kmaq language. So we don't really know what's going on in terms of the complex um, linguistic practices among these people who fill in the census to say that they can speak Gaelic. But nevertheless, that's always the case with, with sort of fairly cumbersome census data of this kind. Um, another thing that the Office of Gaelic Affairs says, they say that a third of Nova Scotians are, are, are descended from families who spoke Gaelic. So a very significant proportion of um, Nova Scotia's one million population. Um, so recently, well, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, the, the, the late James Watson and Marlene Ivey asked a few years ago now, um, this is my translation, they wrote this in the Gaelic, who are these speakers, why are they learning Gaelic, how fluent are they and how often do they use it? These are questions I was trying to, to answer really through my um, 2016 uh, postdoc, which as I say lasted until just, um, just before the start of the current pandemic. Um, and really the idea being to compare Scotland and Nova Scotia, look more closely, zoom in on the role of identities and language ideologies, um, interest among new speakers in heritage, this notion of dolochus in Gaelic, which is incredibly important to the native speakers and to the, the history, culture of the language, um, and whether or not this is um, seen as being relevant for, for people who are acquiring it as a second language. So firstly, I want, finally want to take you through some of, some of the data um, themselves. So this was uh, an interview that I conducted in Scotland. I'll talk briefly about the Scottish context before turning to um, Nova Scotia and then moving on to discuss some of the work that I'm involved in a wee bit more recently. I asked this one speaker uh, based in an urban context in Scotland, um, do you have an identity as a Gael? And uh, they answered me, uh, and although the interview was in Gaelic, answered me in English, uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, really cut off deliberately. Um, perhaps it's a historic thing, you know, the Gales in Scotland really, they were cut off deliberately. It was a state policy issue saying. Um, um, and that othered, they were, they were othered. Um, a gestoch gwyl gwrish yn eilaig, an anir yn eich achrych mi gwrw na geil gyori agos gwrw na geil gyori cho adhert sian. In Ireland, which is where this particular speaker had come from originally, I don't think that um, Irish language, Gaelic language enthusiasts are as othered as that. 
Um, and then there's us. In Ireland, I never felt like, oh, there's the Gales and then there's us. We're separate. Um, but maybe I do feel like that in Scotland. So there's a sense in which um, there's the, the Gales are, are a different group. And the new speakers don't necessarily have any claim to, to using this identity term. Um, this was another speaker I spoke to. This is a, 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 a Gaelic speaker, a new speaker who'd acquired the language to, to fluency um, in post-adolescence and who'd raised his entire family in Gaelic. So I asked him sort of on that basis, are you as a family Gaels um, uh, since you'll, you can all speak Gaelic? And he said, Ach, uh, I only use that word very occasionally, uh, in the context of the present day. He says, I would more, more generally say um, Gaelic people, Loch na Gaelic, vin uh, I would be very, very careful using the word uh, Gael, he says. She bachgug is is over na Gaelic if you can't in hasinja fale maluag. Um, uh, it's, uh, he, he said, um, it's an obstacle to the cause of promoting Gaelic to say we are a separate people. Um, for one, not everyone, not most Gaels would accept me as a Gael anyway, because for them it's more about the, the sort of environment you were brought up in. Um, um, and also, it doesn't let new people into the community. And he says, Marshin na, chavina klechug nagil. So he says, na, uh, I wouldn't use the term the gales. Now, um, to just summarize briefly here, this based on my 30 interviews in Scotland here, um, the idea of having any sort of dis discrete ethno-linguistic identity as gales is, is seen as problematic for most new speakers. Um, there's a sense in which essentialism, ethnocentrism are uh, perceived as characteristics which are really best avoided by, by forward thinking um, Scots in a country which talks about perhaps being independent one day fairly soon. But also there's a, there's a real awareness among new speakers of not wanting to be seen to be guilty of cultural appropriation by claiming an identity for themselves that native speakers wouldn't necessarily include them in. Um, language ideologies among new speakers tend to question the relevance of Gaelic in parts of Scotland, uh, even among people who've become really quite fluent in, in Gaelic. And um, in terms, again, of this, this the extent to which identity has a role to play, um, this traditional traditional ethno, ethnocultural label Gael uh, is generally rejected or downplayed uh, with a preference for a, a more civic conception of Scottish identity. Um, now, that's not the case in Nova Scotia, right? So these are some, some badges which were pieced together a few years ago. Um, Gael, say our name, right? So it's, it's, it almost um, recalls uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, what, say my name, um, what's my name? So it's, 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 it's a very important part of the revitalization strategy that draws upon raising awareness of the existence of this distinctive ethnolinguistic group in, in Nova Scotia. And you see this in some of the data from interviews. So this was um, a speaker from Scotland who'd, who'd moved to Nova Scotia fairly recently. I asked them about, you know, just the, the sort of current uh, revitalization processes uh, over there. Um, and she said, uh, I think that culture and, and heritage, this, this notion that I referred to previously, are quite important to people here in general. Uh, their feelings very strong. Um, so she says, um, 
even though I think that the, the idea of, of heritage and culture is sometimes slightly confused, I think Cape Breton, they, they have much clearer idea of their culture and their history, and it's hugely important to them. Um, so, Anandoy, she shares in cultures, because in Finania, because and root is kudermich, because hagalic a coolishem. So, in a way, it's as if cultural identity is the, mo the most important thing, and Gaelic is a, a bit behind that, a bit, uh, a bit room further back from that. Anan albe chenilan darut kochelche kuche Finania, because because In Scotland, perhaps the two things are not quite so connected: identity and the language. So that was that was the. Um, the perspective of uh, sort of recent uh, migrants in Nova Scotia. Um, this is uh, someone who'd, who'd grown up, I think this is actually someone who'd, who'd come the other direction, who'd, who'd been born and raised in Nova Scotia in, in Cape Breton and who'd um, come to, to Scotland. So um, she said, <laughs> Ach Horosakum Jevam and Gil, Manahashik me at a gal yunsuk, because Nish, Nervismi Coet, Imahuloch, but Hyas, get a hell gallic achkas in Hami Fick and Cogeloch, Sahad, Sandoyan Achka. She says, Speaking about myself, I'd say now that I'm a Gael, that I'm a Gaelic woman, a Gaelic woman, but I didn't know what a Gael was before I started learning Gaelic, and now when I look at my family, I know, although they can't speak Gaelic, they don't speak Gaelic. I can see just how Gaelic they are in their ways. Agus mashrun chanin gavil moran an nalbanuig a ha gmag Gaelach get the hell Gaelic a cotuliug a va Gaelic ek ne tuilich an achco hion is ac a ginnialach na gaa. Therefore, you know, I'd say lots of people in Nova Scotia are quite Gaelic, even though they can't speak Gaelic anymore. Their family spoke Gaelic, you know, a generation or two ago. Um, but uh, they wouldn't recognise the name Gael, you know. The, the, uh, just, you know, Hanagad Gucci, perhaps they'd say, uh, we're Scottish, we're Scotch. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily be familiar with the term Gael. I think that's changing. Um, another person I interviewed explained a sort of similar feeling, but sort of discovering upon starting to learn Gaelic that there was this, this other wealth of culture and tradition. Dar a hoshig ni ar a gaelic, fa da brin ar am slynion, agus jirak fa ping, o, sid ys carach gyr ar a gyrch Sarah Archie Angus, rys yn chawn chi a fashion dar a fami oog. When I started learning gaelic, they were talking about patronymics, and I was, it was just like ping, oh, that's why they called the old lady Sarah Archie Angus uh, when I was young. Agus rydyn ele, mwrshan, agus chawn na siach gyn hoshmi, oh my god, I think I'm gaelic. Um, Mae'n y byg cael ac ymlaen galig y bi cha cha bwyrn o cwm malod yma'n yn albyn nhw ei. Fy mi galig y fi na'r chri yn yw, fy mi ddod cael ei yw nhw. If uh, I didn't have any connection to Gaelic, I wouldn't, I couldn't have continued learning Gaelic in Nova Scotia, sort of uh, uh, intimating quite how difficult it is to learn uh, a language like Gaelic in a context like Nova Scotia. She says, Gaelic has to be in your heart. Fy mi galig fi na'r chri Gaelic has to be in your heart, or you have to make some sort of connection. The uh, finania dunya to a person's identity, which carries on. Ah, chanil mi abrina DNA. I'm not talking about DNA. Um, and what's interesting is that in lots of ways, when you speak to, speak to new speakers of the language, particularly in Nova Scotia, that genetics, DNA as such, isn't what's being talked about. Um, but ancestry. Um, Slonyuch, Shinchirach, these are concepts which are quite important. Um, so I think this this sort of emphasis on on ancestry, on um, how how Gallic your ancestors and how where you how, whether you are, you belong to the the community in those terms is something which other speakers are aware of and perhaps not quite so fond of. So this was someone else I spoke to. Um, I said to them. Uh, I asked a bit about what it meant to have a Gaelic identity. Um, does does this person uh, think of herself as as a Gael? She said, "Be me a ban a Gael hanam." I do say that I am a Gael. Ha gmach kudam achusha. Ha she na fiach na vi klech kudam achusha Gael. Ha irachach trunalinchen. 
Um, it's quite important over here. We do we do try to use that word Gale, um, but it's changed over the years. Um, she goes on for you know Highlander nor Scots. It's changed from calling yourself Highlander or or a Scot, uh, Scottish, Celtic, Jifford, um, different things. Um, I mean, ha 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 shinshul tro purism ashore urdenen. Um, she's quite careful in how she says it. You see, see there's, there's sort of quite a, quite a lot of pausing, quite a lot of um, uh, aggr aggressives sort of saying, pausing and sighing. Um, she says, I think we rely too much on purism here sometimes. Um, and sometimes I don't enjoy that. So that's something which, which certain speakers in Nova Scotia are aware of, this idea of linguistic, but also sort of ethnocultural purity of, of the importance of your ancestors having been Gaelic. And it is something which people uh, are aware of and, and which is, is problematized by some speakers like this um, one. So in terms of uh, sort of conclusion from this, this research, I'm, I'm gonna move on to talk about some of my other um, pieces of, of research rather than investigations I'm involved in just now. In terms of distinctions between Scotland and Nova Scotia, uh, I mean, my friend Michael Newton uh, wrote a few years ago, now that Scotland and Nova Scotia offer differing visions of Gaelic culture that appeal to different audiences. I think you see this coming through in the data. Um, if you think just purely in terms of the identities, the sort of different levels of identity that are available to people in Scotland or Nova Scotia, they're very different. Um, uh, and, you know, what I'm sort of wanting to, to draw out in my next piece of research, this um, Fulbright LP conducting uh, out of Harvard in uh, the autumn is to, to understand how Nova Scotians who've gone to to Boston to New England more generally, uh, what their sort of what the, what new levels of identity have op opened up to them, and um, the difficulties they face in relation to sort of continuing to speak Gaelic. Maybe it's something that across the ocean, across uh, national borders, is less important now that we're all speaking, we're all meeting in this. Um, I can't even say post-pandemic era, but this the, the new normal, which is, has um, developed over the past 15 months or so, maybe it's something which through Zoom and, and, and online meetings has become less important. So for the, the ongoing research that I'm involved in, um, I'm looking particularly at what role identification, identity in the language plays in, in new speakers' greater use of Gaelic, whether in Scotland or Canada or, or America or New England. Um, I'm particularly looking at how Ethnicity association with this label Gale is realized um, among uh, past Gaelic medium students, past immersion students of Gaelic um, who belong to ethnic minorities in Scotland. Um, so for this particular research, um, and obviously it's been principally a digital ethnography, I started on this research at Sussex in September last year. So I've been using Zoom interviews with parents, text interviews, if it was easier to answer questions through emails um, with parents, past pupils and teachers. Um, I'm up to seven, I say seven here, I'm up to eight now, as well as looking at blogs and tweets on the, the issue of multiculturalism in Gaelic medium education, Gaelic immersion in Scotland. Um, and looking particularly on the effects that systemic racism, so it's understood there's this ongoing conversation in the UK just now about the importance as developed um, pretty uh, rapidly off the back of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, a reflection on uh, systemic racism. Now that the, the UK government doesn't want us to use the words, the words systemic racism, they deny that it exists, but that's not the case when you actually hear from um, people who belong to, uh, to ethnic minorities and to people of color generally. So this is a blog post that was um, written by uh, a woman who'd, who'd attended uh, Gallant Medium Education um, in, in Glasgow and who reflected on multiculturalism or the, uh, the lack thereof in Gaelic medium education. She said, I was born and brought up in Glasgow and I have no direct ties to a Yale talk to um, the Highlands Islands or uh, Gaelic culture generally. She goes on, my, my ancestry lies in Ireland and Nigeria, but I attended a Gaelic speaking school from the ages of four to 17 which provide an excellent education and understanding of Gaelic culture. I internalize notions of what it means to be a Gael, to speak the language, what it means to be Scottish. I never saw any reflections of myself within these set values. 
perhaps it's even wrong for it to, to, to call it my language as its culture doesn't immediately represent or include me. I think that's very sad um, and quite concerning. This is because Gallic identity is largely associated with whiteness. In 10 years time, I don't want people to be surprised when they hear someone like me speaking Gaelic and speaking it well. My school days are very much over and I'm not, a li not an, an active member of the Gaelic community. However, I still love speaking my language. And I think it's, it's something which, which falls on us as, as, as Gaelic speakers in Scotland to, um, to problematize this and to, 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 seek to seek solutions to this sort of feeling of alienation, which we also get in this other post um, written by um, another uh, artist based in the Scottish Lowlands, what it's like being black in the Scottish Gaelic community. She writes, my dad's from Ethiopia, and but my mum's from the Isle of Lewis, the largest island in the Outer Hebrides, so the, the Heartland Gaelic um, uh, cultural zone, if you like. She, she explains, both of her parents spoke Gaelic, but looking back on my time in Gaelic medium education is strange and difficult. With just over 1% of Scotland's population speaking it, its cultural significance is not felt by the mainstream, and many people don't feel that language belongs to them. Scotland's a pressure cooker of white fragility, and the Gaelic community bends to its influence in order to preserve space for themselves. For a long time, I couldn't quite articulate my discomfort in the classroom. I don't think many Gaelic teachers are prepared to have pupils of colour in their classroom, let alone understand what that means for the students themselves. When your caregivers don't know what racism really looks like, looks like how can they support you? As an adult, I have tried to push myself out of my comfort zone and attend Gaelic functions, Kayleys and socials. In these spaces, I'm seldom approached, assumed to be a friend of a real Gaelic speaker. For Gaelic to flourish and integrate fully into Scot mainstream Scottish society, the community needs to embrace its speakers of colour and address the inherent white fragility that bubbles under, the, under its psyche. Um, so concerning words and, 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 and big problems, I think, for, for um, Gaelic in relation to, to multiculturalism, when you actually look to actually speak to people who have experienced um, Gaelic medium education. In Scotland, generally, the idea that, as I, as I say, uh, ethnocentrism is something which um, isn't perceived as, as something to be embraced at all. Um, and I, I think part of the problem here involves the tendency in Gaelic medium education, Gaelic um, development in the lowlands in particular, uh, to, to avoid the issue of identity and of, of um, cultural identity. And I think that's something which can be, which can be um, ameliorated. It's, it's, it's an improve, in a situation which can be improved. There, there are solutions um, from within the Gallic world to do with the importance of um, the notion of fosterage of uh, daltachus. And, and historically, it hasn't necessarily been um, kinyag in the sense of of uh, blood, of tribal identity, of, of race. There was no same, no same context of concept of, of race in the Gallic community. But um, the idea of fosterage, regardless of who your parents were, of being part of a part of a community or a family was very important in Gallic historically. And I think that's something which can be developed um, in Scotland as a solution to some of these, these systemic issues. Um, so just to look back in terms of Gallic identities in Scotland and North America, while the language clearly does play an important role in day-to-day -day lives of various new speakers in various countries, um, emphasis on ancestry or identity as a separate ethnic group tends to be avoided. Not necessarily the case in Nova Scotia, um, and I'm not sure what the case will be in Boston or New England when I, I get out there, hopefully in the autumn, but again, we'll have to see if the pandemic permits. Um, in Gaelic medium education and immersion education in Scotland, there does seem to be it's not something which, which Gaelic teachers are guilty of or something which um, the Gaelic stream uh, is, is, is uh, unique uh, in that respect, but I think it's reflective of UK and Scottish society generally, that systemic racism does exist. Um, and um, my ongoing work, so for this HRC funded uh, Speaking Citizens, project based out of the University of Sussex, as well as for uh, my um, 20, my book, which is due out later this year, and the um, Fulbright Award, which I hope to conduct at Harvard later this year. Uh, I'll be hoping to look at uh, what's, what really distinguishes new speakers from the majority of immersion educated um, uh, speakers or, or non-speakers, uh, depending on uh, whether or not they're still using the language in the present day. 
um, to understand a bit more about how cultural identity and ethnicity appear to factor as most motivational variables in Nova Scotia as against Scotland, as uh, potentially against New England generally. Um, I'm going to get around to this, conducting this Fulbright, and to consider the role that identification with the language community tends to play um, in promoting oracy skills in, uh, in the language. Um, and then in turn to look really at the language policy implications, what all this research can tell us about um, strategies for revitalizing Gaelic on either side of, of the Atlantic. Now, um, I noticed that some people have just joined us. I think maybe the difference in, in time zones there, um, advertisement that this, the talk would start at um, one o'clock uh, Central European time rather than um, British summer time might have caused some confusion. So I hope, hope not too many people are going to be disappointed to have missed the main thrust of my talk, but there'll, there'll be other opportunities generally. Um, th this has been recorded um, and will be circulated and um, I'll be very happy to take any uh, questions in the next uh, little while anyway. So I hope that was uh, informative, interesting. And as I say, I'll, I'll hand back over to um, Anik and we can see if uh, there, uh, there have been many questions during the talk or uh, any sort of, uh, pressing issues or remarks that you'd like to, to make. So more than thanks, Sonish Thanks for listening. Um, and we'll hand back over to, to hear from you.